Welcome to episode 97 of Sport SA Daily Diary. Today we're chatting to an Olympic silver medalist, South African rower, Sean Keeling. Afternoon, Sean. How are you doing today? How's it going? Really good and you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, good. Uh, good to chat to you. Uh, and another interesting sport that we, we get to chat about. Yeah, no, it's always uh, really lucky spreading the story of rowing and just telling my own story. So thanks for having me talking to you today. Don't tell us um, how you got into rowing. Um, I believe you were at uh, KES um, and you started in 2000. Was that when you were in Standard 6 or was it a bit later in school? Yeah, and I started uh, in Standard 6. So what happened was I was going to hostel at King Edwards and my dad sent me on a rowing camp so that when I went to hostel, I didn't just lurk and had some mates. Um, and but the bug bit then in that pre camp just before I went to hostel and I carried on through school. Yeah. And I mean, Sean, you you look like you're a sort of my sized um, uh, kind of guy. So the philosophy or the, the, the thought of rowers are all sort of big bulky oaks is, is not really true. It's that you can be sort of smaller guys as well. Well, you want, you want generally one longer levers. Um, I'm 6'4", so it does okay. help with like... So you've got two different categories in, in rowing. You've got heavy, heavyweight and lightweight. So heavyweights have to wear average crew rate under 70 and, and heavyweight lightweight. So have to wear average crew rate under 70 and heavyweights anything above that. So I rode in the heavyweight category. And you want, you know, it's all about power to waste. So you want leverage in the water. It's all about putting your blade through the arc and pinching the boat along that, that arc. So you want levers, but you can also get away. I mean, my partner, Lawrence Britton, was six foot, so it's a little bit shorter than me but um, very powerful. So, you know, it's all about getting the mixtures right and training and rowing together, I suppose. But that's the end of the day, the, the key. And um, Sean, when you were sort of rowing at school, did you immediately take to the sport? Because um, it's not exactly one, it's not like a football or a rugby where, you know, if you played a ball sport, you generally sort of flow into the other ones. Rowing's quite sort of stand off in terms of, of the discipline itself. So I was uh, brought up loving cricket. I mean, Oh my, all that my dad does is on TV is have cricket now, sometimes a little bit of rowing, I suppose. But um, so, like I said, I went on that camp just to meet mates, and I love the sport of the, the teamwork and the hard work. I love all those, the, the discipline part of it. I mean, you get to know, you get to row with your, your mates a lot, and you know, you get to know them really well, and camps and that, you get to stuff around a lot and train hard. So, that part of it did um, bite me, and I really enjoyed it. But what happened actually was that when I went to school, I actually stopped rowing. I went back to cricket in Form 1, the, the summer season of Form 1. And um, we actually didn't enjoy our coach, my under-14C cricket team. So all the other went to polo and I stayed, I went back to rain. So <laughs> I had, uh, had to just test if I still love cricket more. But no, from then, I haven't even looked back. I loved, loved it. And I mean, tell me, did you excel at rowing sort of right from the, from the off-go? I was pretty good. I, re I did uh, re relatively well on the, the Ergo machine. Those are those Concept 2 machines you see in the gym. And I mean, that's basically our stable, our bread and butter of rowing. We do a lot of sessions on those things. Um, and I mean, our distance is a 2K uh, distance. I, I was I trained hard on that. I mean, my dad even got me one. I was lucky enough that he got me one when I was 16. And I used to take that and train on, in my December so that I could come back to try to be the best in the school and in my age group. And I got I got to that level, so I did I did do quite well at that physical activity, and then it just took time to learn the skills because rowing is a skill sport also as well as it's a power endurance sport. And I mean, it must be uh, you sort of have to work on your core quite quite significantly because it is very much a, a core exercise. Yeah, that's the thing about rowing. You know, it's a full body exercise. I mean, like again, if I speak about that rowing machine, if you get on that rowing machine in the gym, you'll see how much it is. It's legs, hips, back, core. And then at the end, the arms. So it really, you, you do do a lot of core exercises and then the guys do a lot of Pilates and a lot of core strength. But you do a lot of that actually when you row. So, you know, it is a bit of getting it done when you're actually rowing also as much as you do a little bit afterwards. And from school, did you carry on uh, rowing after school? Also, I was uh, lucky enough to um, represent South Africa as a junior uh, under 18 level in 2004 and 2005. Um, and then I, I actually joined the High Performance Center in Pretoria. They started in 2005, so I matriculated in 2005, and then I got a virtue there in 2006. So I went to the University of Pretoria, started a marketing uh, degree, 
and uh, rode in and made under 23s uh, 2006 and 2007. And then in 2008, I got really lucky because I got to also go to the Beijing Olympics. Um, so hard works and our sport is obviously every four years, except this year, the, the, the games. Um, and uh, every other year, there's a world champ. So you qualify the year before at the world champs where 11 boats qualify. In our, in our category, there's 13 boats at the game. So 11 qualify the world champs and two late qualify in the other game. So in 2007, uh, Donovan Czech and Ramon De Clemente had qualified the men's pair. And sadly for Donny, he got a back injury and couldn't go. And I was the next best on the stroke side. That's the right-hand side of the boat, as you can see in the picture there. And um, I got the call-up, and it was an amazing experience for me being able to go to the games and race at the at highest level when I was 21. So that was very cool. And uh, tell me, Sean, the, the step up from where you were participating in the Junior Worlds to now going to... The, the Olympics. I mean, it, it must have been quite a, a sort of step up and, and a, a change in the level of competition. Yeah, no, it, it was absolutely massive. I mean, I rode with uh, Ramon De Clemente and Ramon had actually won a bronze medal in the Athens Olympics in 2004 with Donovan Czech. So, I mean, you rode with one of the best guys in the world. You know, you believe you're really good at 21. And, you know, you think you're the, the business. Um, but it was a big step up. I mean, not only learning about rowing, but learning about yourself, you know, like going from strength to strength. But, I mean, we started and we raced. Um, we did a whole big series overseas that year. We raced because also there's three World Cups as well as a World Champs in the year. And uh, Ramon and I raced in all three of those World Cups as well as we went to the Henley Royal Regatta, which is the oldest and most prestigious uh, regatta it's in, in the world, basically. It's well, obviously besides the games again, but it's uh, in, uh, in Henley. And uh, we won that also, which was very cool. But um, we started in the first World Cup making a C final and ended up coming making the A final at the Olympics and coming fifth. So it was a, it was a steep learning curve, but in a really amazing time because you knew you were just going from step to step and getting better and better, which is obviously what you want and what you can strive for when you see the, the results all off the bat. And Sean, I mean, you, you obviously need to be completely in sync with your, with your partner because it's not, I mean, you know, you get team sports where like soccer and stuff, you don't necessarily need to be on the same sort of level at all times. Yeah, you guys need to almost be in unison as one. Yeah, I know it, it is. It's, a, it's exactly, you have to be in a complete unison. I mean, there's all the things about, you got to pinch the boat at the same time. So, I mean, you've got to have your arcs exactly the same. You do have a bit on, your, on the rigger, as you can see in the background there, there's a span. So you can set your spans if your reach is a little bit different so that you can reach the same. But you have to pull it exactly the same time through the stroke. Sorry, a bit of there in my throat. You have, to, you have to make sure that your power curves are exactly the same so that you pinch the boat at the same time and send it through. And also, as you're getting tired, you've got to make sure you're moving with exactly the same sync as the, the guy in front of you or the guy behind you is in the same time. You'll be able to talk to each other to know exactly what's going on. So it is a, it's, a, it's complete unison. And it, that's also what makes it special. Because I talked about doing you know, the power side of the sport, and that's you physically train very hard. and and mentee train hard, but you also exactly you've got to be in unison and make sure that you get that right. Otherwise, you know, you can row as well as you want, but if you're not rowing with your mate, you're not going to go fast at all. And I mean, tell us a bit about that, that first Olympics in Beijing. I mean, you were still relatively young. Um, you know, you, you just come off the, the youth um, uh, world champs or the junior world champs. It must have been an incredible moment for you. Yeah, like it was, it was something special. I mean, you, you, you know, there's a sport you, in life you dream about going to these big things, you dream about going to the Olympics, and to actually find yourself there is something very special. I mean, also, I'd never been to any, any country in the East, and to just see the different culture in that was, it was absolutely amazing. I mean, the Olympics, is, there's so many aspects of it that are special. I mean, the Olympic Village is insane. You just see all the top dogs from around the world. I mean, I remember seeing Bolt there in the, in the food hall, and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, we saw Nadal and, you know, it's, it's like those things that are absolutely amazing, but it's also those things that, you, that can take you away from why you're there. I mean, you are there to do a goal. And only when you realize that and you put yourself in the, you stay on that front foot, will you be able to achieve what you're going there for? So you can't get sideswept, but you also want to enjoy it. So it's a balance and it's something you have to deal with and learn and like mentally prepare yourself for the whole time. And I mean, were you not overwhelmed by where you were in terms of then having to participate in the actual rowing event? Um, 
I never thought about that. Um, I mean, I think I just got, I was enjoying the moment and caught up and I had a really good support uh, staff. I mean, Ramon was, Ramon had obviously done it before. He, he, Ramon also actually, Ramon had also went to Sydney. So it was Ramon's third Olympics. So he did chat to me a lot and speak to me and speak me through the whole thing and the experience and what to expect and what not to expect. And um, I'm a pretty, I don't want to say but I like enjoy things, but also I'm there to race. That's my, that's my goal. That's why I rode. So I was there to race and enjoy the racing. And you know, the racing, even though you've never been to the Olympics, it doesn't change from everything you're doing back here in South Africa. There's nothing that different that they can throw at you. You're literally in rowing. And it's not a contact sport. You have your one lane and you row in your lane and that's it. So once you, on the first few days, you check around and you get used to everything, there's nothing that can change on the day. So I think it's all about preparing yourself for that. I mean, obviously I was a little bit overwhelmed, but I, but I got, by the time we were racing, and I was ready. I mean, we went there quite early also, because uh, obviously the time zone changed. So we went there, I'm mistaken, quite a long time ago. I think we went like two weeks before or 10 days before, something like that. So we really got used to the course. We got used to everything. So by the time we went to the village, we knew exactly what the course was like. And then we knew everything. So we could roll with it as it came. And I mean, your, your dad must have been sort of over the moon um, from sending you to a, a rowing camp in Standard 6 to now watching his son at, at the, the Olympics. I mean, he must have been walking around with a, a head, you know, the, twice the size of his shoulders. Yeah, I don't know. My dad, <laughs> he loves it and he, and he absolutely loves it. My dad is also actually an old boy of King Edwards and he played cricket and hockey. So when his son uh, did rugby and rowing, I think he didn't really know what to do. <laughs> but uh, he was, he's, he's the proudest guy in the world. And, um, you know, he, he's a very special man. That Oku is my hero. He has done so many things in his life. And just to be able to make him proud makes me proud. You know, that's, that's what it's about. That's very special. Thank you. Um, Sean, you've obviously been to quite a few world champs um, almost every second year. You mentioned a bit earlier that um, uh, when you got to Beijing, you guys checked out the course. Do Rowing courses differ. I mean, it's not just water is water is water. Well, look, it, it does differ a bit, and also the boats differ. So the boats that we row in here in South Africa are exactly the same shape and mold as the boats um, overseas. I mean, in the, all us Africans, we row in Filippi boats. That's an Italian make. Um, so you, we get the same boats, and they ship a chair, and we row in a chair. But when you go overseas, you rent the same boat. And you rent for a whole year, but it is slightly different. So it takes you a little bit of time to make sure you check it out. And your coaches have to rig up the exact same settings that you have in the boat chair. So it takes you one or two days just to make sure you've got the same settings and get the feel right. And the water, I mean, the, it does get a little bit different, but after about two or three days, you feel, feel right. Also from the flight and that, you know, you feel a bit funny sometimes. So you're thinking it's one thing, but your mind plays tricks in your game. So... Water is exactly the same. Athletes are temperamental people, and then it's just calm down. Um, but, well, but it does take a few days, and then you, you're absolutely fine. And Shona, you guys had uh, a bit of a disappointment in 2012, missing out on the London Olympics. Um, did you use that as a sort of key learning for um, later elements of your career? Because after 2012, you had some, some big success. Yeah, you know, 2012, it really hurt. Um, it, was a, it was a very difficult time in my life, um, not going to that games. And it was very difficult um, with how everything worked out for me and uh, the games. But, you know, the, uh, our lightweight four obviously won gold and then games. And those little rats, and a lot of them are some of my best friends, I call them little rats, because I raced against them in school and beaten them in training. So, you know, that result of there almost spurred you on to say, you know, if these guys can do it, so can you, because you come from exactly the same experiences, exactly the same things. So that definitely did help. But it also what it, when it is, and the further thing is, I knew that Rio was my last cycle, and those were coming to my last thing. So obviously you, you learn from everything you've been through, going to Beijing, going through everything. And when you get to those, your results are, you do get better as an athlete and as an individual, I suppose, moving forward. But I mean, it seems like you certainly used um, that experience because come 2014 in the World Cup in Amsterdam, you guys walked away with a bronze medal. Yeah, I know, and it was actually, um, it was awesome because obviously, yeah, missing out on London was terrible and um, it was a big decision to carry on. So winning a medal with uh, Vincent Bert in, in Amsterdam in 2014 was an amazing feeling for me because I knew I had made the right call 
and staying in the ring. Always knew I was good enough to get onto a podium. And getting that podium medal was absolutely an amazing experience. Um, a very cool time with Vince that year. We actually only rode for a few months. Um, and to win a uh, bronze with him was a very cool, very cool experience. Also, in, at the Boss Barn in Amsterdam, Amsterdam's a very cool place. And I suppose it'll always be special to me now <laughs> also. And Sean, you've had three different partners or sort of major partners throughout uh, your rowing career. Who makes the choice in terms of who partners who? So the coach at the end of the day makes the final choice. I mean, our coach, um, and he's still the coach now, is Roger Barra. I mean, Roger's an exceptional coach. And uh, also, you, you never really see what Roger does because he does so much behind the scenes for the team, never mind only coaching. So at the end of the day, they make the, the choice. I mean, you say that, I mean, that, that you look at the Beijing cycle, that was not Beijing, sorry, the, the Rio cycle, it was, I rode with um, four different guys, three different guys. So I mean, I rode, in 2013, I rode with Lawrence. Uh, 2014, I won the medal with Vince. In 2015, David Hunt and I actually qualified the boat. Um, and then back in Rio, Lawrence got back into the boat. I mean, how it works in rowing is that you have to come in the top 11 that I spoke about at the World Champs. And it's not the athlete that, that qualifies the boat. So South Africa had qualified a men's pair. So then um, how it works is that after that, everyone has to fight to get back in that boat. You know, it's very difficult when... Um, you're racing out from overseas, but when you're racing your mates, it's even more difficult and you're very close knit family. So it's um, luckily the choice is not yours, and the choice is the coaches. He can see that through all the things you're doing, who is the best and who fits the best in the mold with the best athletes. And that's how at the end of the day it's decided. And can a country only qualify one boat for uh, at sort of either a World Champs or an Olympics? So, yeah, so the World Champs and Games, you can only qualify one boat. There are quite a few different boat classes. Um, so, I mean, you can have a skull, a double, and a quad. Those are two blades each, and then you get a pair, a four, and an eight. Those are the, the type of boats that you can get, and you can only qualify one in each event. So, I mean, we uh, in, in Rio, we actually had five A finals. Um, we had five boats that qualified, five A finals, that meant pair and four. So, you know, it works out. And then two women's boats, and then our lighty double and so on. So, I mean, through this, this period, you were kind of the consistent um, element, if you call it, um, through the World Champs and, and through the, the different Olympics. Did that essentially make you the strongest um, member of the team in terms of the, the cockless pair? I would like to believe that. <laughs> but, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't know. You just obviously go there and you try and make sure that you never lose. Um, you know, we in the rowing system, how it works is you, you have, um, obviously, we train every day of the week and you have on a Wednesday and a Friday and as it gets closer more days you have you do pieces and the, the Roger puts out a ranking sheet so you can see on those days who is the best and who's the worst and those ranking sheets are worked out on your boat time versus the world best time on a prognostic scale so you know all the time even when you're with different partners you can see where you rank the men's pair versus the lightweight girls double versus the lightweight men's double so you're always trying to vie for the top position at least in your weight um, in your boat class and obviously to beat the other crews so all the time you're racing basically um and you've got to try and be con as consistent as possible and try to be the best you can all the time so i in in that in that uh, four-year cycle I, I did i come out more often and then not on the top of the, the heavyweight men's which is what i strive for and try to do all the time especially when they're race pieces and sean of the the three partners that you had um Obviously, no disrespect to any of them, but was there one that you preferred uh, rowing with the most? No, I, I, it's a difficult question because they're all really good mates of mine, and they all bring so many different aspects into the boat. I mean, of course, the the one of the memory I'll cherish the most is our silver medal with Laurie. I mean, I can't I can't ask for more than than that, and and the memory you had in that, and also Lawrence now um, tried a late qualify in 2012 um, in the London Olympics, and we missed that. So he's the one I'd actually rode the most with. But I mean, the medal with Vinci and uh, Vince is what he brings to the boat and qualifying with Nod, you can't actually, I wouldn't say I, I have a favorite. I mean, I have a favorite race, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> I suppose you'd have to pick that one as a race. But um, no, they're all, it's all really good. And it, what, what was special to me in the end um, of the whole cycle was that um, I said that the heavyweight men's forward qualified and Vincent and, and David were in that four. So, I mean, they actually did phenomenally well. They late qualified and came fourth. Fourth. So sadly, they just missed out on that bronze medal. But had the race of their lives, 
were in third place, gave everything, were in third and got, got beaten by the Italians into fourth. But, you know, when you, you've given everything and you get beaten, there's nothing more you can do. And Sean, tell, talk to us a bit about um, the silver medal race. Um, did you guys go in expecting that you could win a medal? Yeah, so we had a um, we had a really good year that year. Um, so and another story is and, and um, is that Lawrence actually uh, was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer, in two thousand and fourteen. Um, so I'm, I'm back to back story to to four story. Yeah. Um, so Laurie was diagnosed with cancer in 2014, and um, that's when uh, he got dropped at the end of 2013, and that's when I rode with Vince. And when Laurie got diagnosed, it actually made so much sense why well, we, we just kept on getting sick and not doing well before that. We chatted about it a lot. And Laurie's recovery story is absolutely amazing. I mean, he was diagnosed. He went to Amsterdam, raced in the Cox pair with David Hunt, um, and he was diagnosed just after that, started chemo, and then raced and the world champs the following year in 2015 in the men's four. So he, he has an exceptional story. The medic is as hard as the head, in the head as nails. And I'm not sure if it's clever or stupid, but he's an exceptional <laughs> athlete and an amazing oak. Um, so, yeah, so we actually had a really good year in 2016 from, from Lawrence recovery and, and me trying to be consistent all the time. We, we raced then the second World Cup when we came, we got a first World Cup, sorry, and we got a bronze medal, which we knew I mean, there were some crews missing and the Kiwis weren't there, the, the, the guys that beat us in the end. So we knew that we were around about. So from that, we had good building steps. And then we, we got to our third World uh, Cup um, in Lucerne, Switzerland. And for us, Lucerne is like the mecca of rowing. So you talk about different courses and that. We, we say that Lucerne is like God's gift to rowing. It's a beautiful, natural course, like 2.2 Ks long. So our rowing course is 2 Ks long. So 2.2 Ks long, just so you can fit it in. And there's like the the cows on the thing on the side with their cowbells you can almost smell the chocolate from it's beautiful it's absolutely beautiful and there's because it's um just this little lake that's not much lighter than wider than the six lanes there's not much wind so i mean obviously wind affects uh, our sports and with, without the wind it makes it a fairer course so that's why we call it the mecca of rowing and in all my years i'd really wanted to win a medal uh, at Lucerne. I didn't get the chance before it, and, and Laurie and I found us in the third World Cup there, knowing that we saw her in the mix and if we could put ourselves out there. And we we gave a go, and coming to the thousand, we're in fourth place. Then in the in the final sprint, we got into second with 200 meters to go, and we were just pipped on the line by second and third by 0.2 of a second. Um, so it was it was really gut wrenching and and, and cuck um, because I also knew it was my last time in in, in Lucerne, but. That was two months before the games. And every time the training got tough for us and every time we were under pressure or just missing anything, Laurie and I called each other in the training point two because we knew that when it got to the games, there was not a stuff that we were going to go in the mix and lose by that. We were either going to be all in or shut out the back door. So that like really built on that, the intensity of those last two months, building up to the games. Um, so we, we knew that we were around... We were around it when we were going in, but we all had to step up big time and we had to have the race of our lives in the games to be able to make it. Um, we had a relatively uh, good build up um, um, when we got to the games. Uh, we, we got there early, you know, the time zone change, getting used to the water, getting used to athletes' temperaments like a poker about, you know, finding the boat. Um, Laurie was a bit sick um, a few days before, but because of that two month period, we were pretty chill and we had a, a relatively, we had a good heat. Uh, went through to the semi, had a good semi, got through to the final, and then on the final we um, had a, a cracker race. You know, um, I know I'm talking a lot now, but you know we had a cracker race. Like uh, we we always had good uh, starts. So in the race we, we had a great start in the heat, the semi, and all the other actually world champs. Lawrence now have some quick twitch fiber. I don't know, or other oaks just sleep on the start, but we come there with the vengeance. So we got off the mark really well. Um, and we actually led through the first quarter of the race, which I mean, an Olympic a final, and you're leading in the first quarter. Like, what, what, what more can you ask for? Pretty, pretty cool. Um, but then we knew in the in the second quarter that we actually had a lot of work to do in all our other races. That's where the other teams had moved on us, and especially the Kiwis. Um, that's where they really start laying down the the law. I mean, those like, they hadn't lost for eight years. They one from 2009 until that, it hadn't lost a single race. I mean, I don't know in any other sport where a team had ever done that. They didn't pull out for injury or illness and they didn't lose. So we knew that that's that from that quarter that we had to really go with those guys. 
um, and didn't work like that for us. The conditions were a bit rough and they got on top of us and we started slipping back through the field in that um, second 500. And it's always funny um, when we talk through the race and that you talk about that second 500 because it's true, you know, that's when you start slipping back, you go to those dark holes in your mind that you don't want to happen, but that sometimes happen. And then you get those negative thoughts that start keeping it. And those more negative thoughts, the slower and slower you're going to go. So we were in that place and we had to get out of that hole to get back on that front foot. Um, and coming through a thousand, we found ourselves in fourth place again, similar to Lucerne. Um, and that's where we, 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 we changed our mindset a bit. We, we spoke to each other that one case saying, believe, believe in yourself, believe in the time that we've done. And we started moving through with the other crews. Um, still fourth with five, 500 meters to go. And that's when Lawrence called point two. Well, point two never again because we were coming back to that sprint. We we're coming back to that thing in Lucerne um, where we had just mm -hmm. missed out. And then we actually, in the next 150 meters, we rode through second and third and put ourselves into second and then held that line until the end. And that's what's <laughs> very cool. <laughs> uh, Sean, we'll come to the elation of, of winning that silver medal and, and you can show it to us shortly. But I've chatted to a couple of athletes over the last uh, sort of a uh, few weeks. And there's been a sort of debate in terms of what's worse, coming fourth or coming second. In your opinion, obviously now you've had Lucerne where you've come fourth, and now you've missed gold at Rio by coming second. You've still got a medal, which is a phenomenal achievement. In your opinion, which is worse? It depends how it happens. So for us, we came second, but we weren't going to win gold. We were not good enough on the day. The team that beat us, in, in my opinion, it was much better than us. So um, fourth would have been infinitely worse than winning second. I mean, and with, with fourth, you know, you don't get a medal. So, you know, um, I think fourth is, is way worse. But it also, to me, it's how it happens. I mean, you could, if you were in first until the last, like two strokes and you lost second, then second would be, comp would be terrible. And if you were fourth by 100 meters, you know, then fourth would be okay. So it, it's all about circumstantial and the, your race versus the other, you know, races. And, and again, in rowing, you can only have your race. And we had a really good race, so very happy with it. I can't complain. And tell, us, tell us about the elation of uh, crossing that finish line, knowing that you'd come second, knowing that you'd achieved something in probably what had been your last Olympics. Um, that must have been a, a pretty gut-wrenching moment for you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very special. I mean, you, you physically absolutely stuffed after that race and but mentally stuff. The first thing you try and do, you probably hit the water. You know, I never really hit the water in Rome, but I hit the water there because that was very special. And then you try and hug your mate, you know, but you're so stuffed, you're like falling out the boat to try and hug the oak for me, hug the oak behind me. But it's, um, you know, it, it's what I think is really special is all the times that you you train uh, building up to, even as a lighty that talk about going on the urban and, and dreaming about going to the games, you dream about winning a medal. You dream about for us it's crossing that finish line and know you've got it. And then every time, even if you go for a run on a Sunday, you know, you dream about like how you're going to row and crossing the line. And now you find yourself crossing that line. It's something, it's something that, you know, I've been asked a lot of times and I still can't put it into words because it is just absolutely spectacular. And it's all your dreams and goals getting achieved right there and there. And it's, um, I suppose it's a, the moment you'll hold, I'll hold till my dying day, which is it's very special indeed. It's when you've got your medal there for us to see. Um, why is it not in some enshrined frame with pictures of you crossing the line? And uh, where do you, do you keep it in a safe or? The, the light's a bit bad, um, but you can see it there. Um, no, so our theory is, you know, say there, uh, the light, uh, our theory is, you know, if you put it in a safe, then no one can see it and feel it and, 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 and touch it. So, I mean, it is about sharing that that experience with other people so that they can see that if you can do it, they can do it and believing in themselves. So that, that's why we don't put it in a, a, a Lawrence and I don't put in a safe, you know, we want to keep it. And now if I had in a safe, I wouldn't be able to show you now. But um, my dad does have a shrine about it in and, and his house. So there is always that that I'll probably get when I'm older. So, <laughs> um, But no, so I just, I just hide it at home. And then every time um, I can show someone that asks, I do. And uh, Sean, just in closing, um, you're still quite vocal in terms of um, uh, rowing in South Africa. You seem to be still quite involved. Um, 
is it still a very much a passion for you? And do you see yourself being involved in, in rowing for time to come? Yes, it's definitely a passion. It's definitely something that I really believe is, for me, it's the best sport in the world. And um, hopefully this convinces more people that it is the best sport in the world. Um, um, I'm not as involved as I'd like to be, but I do try, just try and especially keep in touch with the guys that are doing it now, see if I can, especially at my old school and school, try and chat to them and try and share experiences so that they can maybe carry on after school, because it is obviously difficult um, uh, in South Africa rowing. Um, but it is something that I, I truly believe in and um, that I hope can carry on through the future. I mean, we'll see how our guys do uh, now next year. Um, we've got some seriously talented athletes in, and it's all about, sadly for us, it's all about the Olympics. I mean, people don't see it otherwise. Every, every time the Games comes around, rowing is a hot topic because we've done relatively well in the past, um, the past few Games, winning some medals. And I mean, that's what guys see. But I mean, if they could see the background, behind everything, they would be more involved in complete because it is a seriously um, demanding sport and what the guys can, what the guys go out and do there is, is spectacular. Yeah, I mean, my, my cousin's daughter is quite heavily involved in, in rowing at St. Stillians and the time that he has to go and spend by the side of the river, it's, it's pretty much all weekend, you know, the entire weekend. It's not just a two hour football match, it's, it's the whole weekend. Yeah, no, look, if we, um, I've also actually um, married a St. Stephen's girl that was a row, also uh, Kate Keeling now, but she was Kate Johnson. She also wrote for South Africa. And I can tell you, we both say that if we have uh, kids that want to row, I'm going to direct them towards water, water polo because it's a hot day on our Saturday. But no, I'm joking. You definitely go to plot. But the parents are the ones, they're the ones that, that give you that passion because it, it's their, it is their whole Saturdays. And most of the time, their whole week. So it's, they're the ones that let you achieve your dreams. So they're the ones that deserve um, it's more than you than you do the attention on that. They are the true heroes and some heroes. I hope when you guys do have kids, you are going to put them into a, a, a boat because cheapers with the the parents they've got, they should be uh, winning gold medals left, right, and center. Let's hope. <laughs> Sean, it's been brilliant chatting today on Sports Essay Daily Diary. Thank you very much for your time. Um, good luck with uh, you know guiding future South African stars in, into. Uh, Olympic medals because I do think it's imperative that that ex athletes do stay involved. Thank you so much, Adam. I really appreciate uh, it, and yeah, I love hearing the story about rank. So it's, uh, spreading the word. So thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Don't miss tomorrow's episode of Sport SA Daily Diary. We reach out to a South African that became four times World Surf Ski Series champion.